are precious, as we all know. So the sermon today will be from the Bible reading that we read from 1 John 4, 7 to 1 John 5, 5. And the topic of the sermon will be on the love of God. And the hymns that we've sang uh, are have been picked to arouse that in us tonight. So I have just three simple points uh, as the outline. The first will be talking about the essence of God's love. The second point, the evidence of God's love. And the third, the effect of God's love. Those are the three simple points. So the essence of God's love, we can see that in verse 7 and 8. And if I read that again, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And we'll be looking at God's love today. Before we do that, let us pray that God gives us the wisdom that we need through his precious Holy Spirit. And Father, even as we reach out to go into your word that you have given us through faithful men, through the author of the Holy Spirit, help us to understand that which we read, that your word will bear fruit and life in our hearts, even to the praise of your marvelous grace, we pray. Amen. Okay, so the essence of God's love from verse 7 and 8. So what is the essence of God's love? It's God himself, because God is love in himself. And it is important that we do not confuse what love is. We know that a version of love that is different from biblical love is being portrayed in the world that we live at the moment. Bible words have Bible meanings, dear saints. Love has been defined for us. In 1 Corinthians 13, from verse 4 through to 8. I love the way the New King James puts it. I mean, I use the ESV, and most of the Bible verses I learned were in the ESV. But I love the KJV and NKJV for their rawness and just plainness. And we thank God for Bible translations. For whatever educational status you have, there's a Bible translation for you. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love suffers long. I mean, you can translate it as love is long-suffering. It's amazing. The ESV says love is patient. And it goes on. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. It's not rude. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked doesn't rejoice in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It's amazing, dear saints. And he goes on. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. What does it bear? What does it believe? All that it relates to love. And we can tell from that definition of love that there are three attributes to genuine biblical love. It is selfless, self-sacrificial, and self-giving. Which is why when our Lord Jesus Christ, he mentioned in three parts of Scripture, in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, he said, whoever desires to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Do you understand what true love is. Selfless. Self-sacrificial. Self-given. Which is different from the love that is being sold in the world at the moment. It's akin to self-worship. Which is a distortion of what it is. The essence of God's love is God himself. Second point are the answers of God's love. There was never a time God was not loving. He's always been loving, dear saints. Why do I say that? In the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ, in John 17, from verse 24, 
wonderful chapter, scripture. He said, Father, I desire that they whom you have given me may be where I am to see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. What was God the Father doing before he created? He was loving the Lord Jesus Christ, they're saying. That's why the Trinity makes sense. Any religious system trying to sell the idea to you that God is one person in one being does not work. And I had this discussion with a Muslim at work. I said, who was your God loving before creation? Who was he loving? If he could not love before creation, that means he lacks love. And if he lacks love, he can't be God because God does not lack. We have the God that is love, loving the beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ, with the spirit of love, glorious triunity of God. God the Father, by God the Son, by God the Holy Spirit. And the only analogy that I, we can even conceive to get our toe into the water is one times one times one is one. That's the only one we can even attempt to use to dip our toe into the water. That God is God in himself. And there's love within that community of the Godhead. And that love is shed abroad and we are dragged in to experience of that beautiful love within God himself. But God is not just love, they're saying. Because that's the other thing that you hear in the society we live in at the moment. They say love is love. But what does that mean? What does that mean, love is love? God is not just love. Because if you, you're meeting me today, and I'm meeting you today for the first time, if someone asks you, oh, did you meet Kenny today? You say, yes, I met Kenny. Describe Kenny. Oh, so Kenny's a black man. Okay, what else? Kenny's a black man. What else? Kenny's a black man. You can't stop at that. So God is not just love. He has other wonderful attributes. So where do we see that? Where else? We go to Exodus. Yes, Exodus, they're saints. Exodus 33, 18, when Moses pled with God and said, please show me your glory. And I've always found the verse after to be very curious. When God said, I will make all my goodness to pass before you and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I thought, show me your glory, my name the Lord. The reason is that God's glory and his name are inextricably linked, they're saying. Which is why in Jesus' high priestly prayer, the last verse of that prayer, he said, I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with you to love me may be in them and I in them. So what are these other glorious attributes of God? We see that in Exodus 34, verse 6. When God passed by Moses and he said, The Lord, the Lord God, which is an allusion to the Trinity, by the way. The Lord, the Lord God. Because I wondered at first, why such repetition? God was trying to tell Moses something. The Lord, the Lord God. Merciful and gracious slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the children's children to the third and fourth generation. We can see from those attributes that God is holy, which is why he has to deal with sin. It's amazing. That our God is not just love. He has other wonderful, glorious attributes, they're saying. So many other wonderful attributes that he revealed to Moses. Such precious words from Scripture, they're saying, so that we know who God is. And when Jesus is praying in the high priestly prayer, he has made known to us the name of God the Father, and will continue to make it known. Why? So that the love with which he, he has been loved will be in us and he in us. 
their sins. God is overflowing with love. Second point, the evidence of God's love. And the evidence of God's love, I, I would love to divide into two parts. The external evidence of God's love and the internal evidence of God's love. The external evidence of God's love we see in verse 9 and 10 of 1 John 4. And if I read verse 9 and 10, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. You cannot talk about God's love without talking about what he gave their saints. God's love, true love, is not passive. It's active. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But how about 1 John 3.16? Now, that's a verse as well. By this we know love, that Christ laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. Love is not passive. It's active, dear saints. It's giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. What God demands from us, he has already provided beforehand. He doesn't need us for anything. He is a God that continually gives and gives and gives and gives. God has showed us what true love is, and we must also show the same to others. The external evidence of God's love, you need to understand the extent to which God went and the expense to which it costed him. The extent of it, think about it, dear saints. God, our creator, has walked on human soil. That is mind-blowing. When people at work say, oh, if there's God, let him show himself. I say, but he has. He has. He walked on human soil. He's, he has. What more do you want? He has. It's amazing, dear saints. So I can imagine Paul's astonishment when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.16, when he said, great indeed is the mystery of godliness we confess. God was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed on among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. That is our God, dear saints. What condescension that God, our creator, will come and take on flesh for us, undeserving beings. That's why I love Philippians 2 from verse 4. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself of no reputation. Some translations say he emptied himself. Taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But he didn't stay that way, dear saints. Because the verse goes on, for God has highly exalted him and has given him the name that is above all names, that the name of Jesus, every knee must bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because, dear saints, we have a redeeming Savior, a reigning Lord, and a returning King. Such is our God. That was the extent of his love. How about the expense? What did it cost him? It cost him his life. It cost him everything. That salvation is free, but it is expensive, dear saints. And I love Romans 5, because who can put it better than Paul himself through the author of the book, the Holy Spirit? Romans 5, from verse 6 through to 8. 
He said, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were not special, they're saying, and he died for us. It's inconceivable that unlovable beings, unworthy beings, the God of creation would die for us. And he did. That is what he did to save us from sin. Such is the love of our God. That true love must cost you everything, dear saints. If you truly love our God and Savior Jesus Christ, it must cost you everything. Your person, your plan, your purpose, your time, your talent, your treasure, it must cost you everything. So when the Lord says, whoever desires to be my disciple, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily, says the Luke account in Luke 9.23, and follow me. Because it's all about him, dear saints. How about the internal evidence of God's love? We see that in verse 12 and 13. And I read, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Verse 13, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. It's incredible, dear saints. The same spirit that was in the Lord Jesus Christ has been given to us as well. Why have I said this? Because scripture tells us that. Romans 8, from verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And you are not left out, ladies, because the Greek word for sons there is of any gender. Some translations translate it as our children of God, which I like. He said, for we have not received the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father, dear saints. And what is remarkable is people think that Abba, Father, the first mention is in the book of Romans. No. The first mention of Abba Father is in the book of Mark, in the Garden of Gethsemane, from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that intimate time in the Garden when he was distressed and anxious, and he was bleeding drops of blood, which is a medical condition, by the way. It's called hematidrosis. It signifies great distress and anxiety. Jesus said, Abba Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Abba, Father, that same spirit of endearment has been given to us. That's incredible. And that's why Romans 8, it goes on. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, and if heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Because true love, dear saints, must cost you everything. It has to. The same spirit in our Lord Jesus Christ, he gave us in his grace to us as well. Why? Because we are loved. We are loved, dear saints. We are loved. So how do we summarize this part? If God is in us, God's love is in us. And if God's love is in us, love is in us. And if love is in us, we love one another. Why? Because God is in us. They're saying. That's how we summarize the evidence of God's love. The last point. The effect of God's love. What kind of effect should it have in our lives? I love the way Paul puts it in Ephesians 5.1. It said, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ who loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's what Paul said. Walk in love. 
as the master walked. So from the parts of scripture that we've read from 1 John 4, 7 through to 1 John 5, 5, there are six ways that the effect of God's love affects us. Now, I'm not a very clever person. Once I hear six, I'm thinking way too many points. So to make life easy, there's a simple way to remember it. A, B, C, D, E, F. Easy to remember. A, it gives us assurance. And we see that in 1 John 4, 18. And I read, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. He gives us assurance, they're saying, that we are loved. That we are loved by the God of creation. God has given everything to us. The fullest expression of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the way Bible commentator puts it. He said, the Lord has a face and it is Jesus Christ. What more do you want? He has words and it's the words of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, and God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God has a face, and it is Jesus Christ. And it makes sense. Why? Which is why we should not have any graven image of God. Why? Because God already has an image, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why. That second commandment was enacted because God has an image and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. I love Hebrews as well, Hebrews 1. He is the radiance of the glory of God. It's all about our Lord Jesus Christ, they're saying. A, gives us assurance. B, it gives us belief that Jesus is the Christ. We see that in 1 John 5, 1, the A part. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And that is what it's about. And that is the problem with the world at the moment. They will concede that Jesus existed because the evidence is irrefutable, but they will not want to concede that Jesus is God. That is why when I meet anyone and he says, oh, I'm a Christian, I say, oh, I'm a Christian because Jesus is God. Let's just, let's just get straight to it. Let's, let's stop the small talk and get straight to it. Jesus is God. What do you reckon? Because that is the test, dear saints. And that is what the world will not concede to. But Jesus is God in the flesh. C, it gives us confidence for the day of judgment. We see that in 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. The ESV translates that as confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so we are in the world. As our Father is, so we are in the world. It gives us confidence for the day of judgment. And I love the way that, I think Alistair Begg puts it, that the thief on the cross, when he gets to heaven, he was speculating, but what wonderful speculation, that when the thief on the cross gets to heaven and he's asked, oh, did you fulfill all the doctrines of justification and sanctification and glorification? You say, what? What? What do you mean? Why are you here? The man on the cross told me to come. That's why I'm here. The man on the cross told me to come. That's why I'm here. That's why we're all here, they're saying. Because Jesus said, come. And he gave us faith. And that's why we're saved. Because it's all down to him, not us. It gives us confidence for the day of judgment. D, it gives us a desire to obey God's commandments. We see that in 1 John 5, verse 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. That's it, dear saints. You cannot claim to love and not do. That's impossible. 
And I love the way Jesus was explicit about it in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he was very emphatic in verse 21 of that same chapter, John 14. He said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he that loves me. And whoever loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Because that's what it's all about, dear saints. If you love, you will do. How else can my wife tell if I love her if I don't do what she needs me to do? That is love. I hate doing the dishes. I hate it. We have a dishwasher, but I still hate doing the dishes. But when I'm trying to be on a good side and show that I'm loving, I'm doing the dishes, and say, honey, I'm doing the dishes. I'm doing the dishes. How else can you show that you love if you do not do? Dear saints. Point five, it gives us the eagerness to love the saints. And we see that in 1 John 5, 1, the B part. I'll read the whole verse. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of God, of him. You have to have an eagerness to show love to the saints, dear saints. That's how you know that you have the love of God within you. And F, it gives us faith that overcomes the world. And we see that in 1 John 5, 4. For everyone, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I love the way Bible commentator puts it. He said, our faith is the victory. Our faith is the victory. And it just reminds me of that wonderful piece of scripture, 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 53. I love the way it's put in the ESV said, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal flesh must put on immortality. So when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. That is our inability to keep the law perfectly. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We are loved, dear saints. We are loved. So, how do we conclude the sermon for tonight? It's simple. If God is in us, God's love is in us. And if God's love is in us, love is in us. And if love is in us, we love one another. Why? Because God is in us. Let us pray.